Welcome. Thank you for coming on this Monday. I'm really happy to introduce Brian Allen. Brian is associate professor um, in, uh, in the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. He got his PhD in urban studies from MIT in 2007. Um, he is expert in civic engagement and public participation, demography, housing policy and planning, immigration and refugee services and policy, uh, and urban and regional planning. In recent years, his work has focused mainly on two things, um, on the community and economic development processes of immigrants in the United States, and on how households have responded to the foreclosure crisis, as well, on the flip side, how the foreclosure crisis has affected neighborhood quality in the United States. Um, very happy to have you today. This is your prize, your trophy. He has a cold, so be nice. Be nice. Um, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rob. Thanks. It's, it's great to see such a nice crowd. Um, I was just reflecting on the knowledge that I was going to get a mug because the one I got the last time I was here is now chipped. Um, so it was divine intervention, I guess, that brought me here today to get a new mug. Um, <clears throat> I want to present uh, a work in progress uh, and acknowledge first and foremost my co-author, uh, Dave Van Riper, who is here. Um, we started talking about this about a year ago as to what it would mean to use a complete count census uh, to get a handle on a public affairs question that's really important to me, and that is who benefits from public housing, right? Um, and so as we, as we continue to discuss, this is the project that unfolded. So I'm going to talk to you about um, a couple of things. The first thing is um, I want to highlight a methodological uh, innovation that I think Dave and I have, are, are contributing to this particular kind of work. Um, and the second thing I want to talk about, and the more substantive thing I want to talk about, are the, the residents characteristics of those who benefited from public housing when public housing was ascending in the United States, right? Today, for those of you who are aware of, the arc of public housing is very much waning. It is, it is uh, 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 on, the, on, the, on the downside um, by many measures. But now we're gonna, I'm going to focus on, on when it was brand new uh, within the U.S. and what we were trying to achieve with that. And, and who benefited. Um, so those are, the, those are going to be the key things to, um, that, to come away from this talk with. Um, let me put this in a little bit of context. <clears throat> By 1940 in the U.S., uh, there were approximately 30,000 units of public housing. Those units of public housing were spread across 41 cities in 22 different states, including uh, the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. So there was definitely an attention uh, by 1940 of, of how we were going to allocate this resource broadly in a geographic sense. To put this again in context, today we have approximately 1.2 million public housing units. So this is really just uh, the, the very beginnings, right? Our first cautious steps uh, into public housing is what I'm going to be talking about today because I'm, I'm going I'm to address this 1940 era. There were a couple of pieces of legislation that it's important to um, to know about before uh, we get into some of the data innovations and so on. I have a cold. The good news is I sound a lot worse than I feel. Um, <laughs> the bad news is you've got to listen to me. Um, two pieces of, uh, of legislation. One was the National Industrial Recovery Act, uh, abbreviated NIRA. Um, this is a part of the New Deal uh, uh, set of legislation that came out of the, uh, uh, the Roosevelt administration during the Great Depression was passed into law in 1933. Um, it created uh, the Public Works Administration, uh, which many of you may be familiar with from high school history classes, or, or if you've gone further in history, uh, certainly uh, more advanced history courses touch on that as well. It's an important uh, uh, component of the, um, of the uh, a New Deal era in, in the US. Less understood was the housing division that was created as a part of this, right? And so the legislative intent here was twofold. It was to inject money into the construction sector, right? As we're building new housing that's going to be controlled by the U.S. government. That'll put people back to work, right? And so that was an important uh, goal of the legislation. The other goal of the legislation, though, was to create high-quality housing for people of, uh, of, of less uh, economic means. Um, initially, in fact, um, there were no income limits that were put in place in this housing, this, this first public housing that the NIRA created. That didn't last long, right? and if you're familiar at all with public housing today, you know it targets extremely poor households. Um, well, the income limits that did come into play 
meant that we were targeting with this new housing the submerged middle class, the so-called submerged middle class, uh, the, the essentially the middle income folks who had been really hit hard by the Great Depression. Right? This is a politically potent group. Um, they didn't carry any of the stigmas associated with long-term uh, uh, impoverished households, um, and it was, a, it was a definite political focus of the Roosevelt administration for this particular piece of legislation. <clears throat> Eventually, they also put in uh, a minimum, which is somewhat new. Right? Those of you who follow public housing today, there is, we don't really tend to think of a minimum uh, income, right? but they were putting a floor as well, right? And so what emerged from this legislation was a, a very narrow target on what I would call moderate to lower moderate income households in the U.S., right? That was the target of this house, of this legislation. Um, let me move on to the next piece of legislation that's important here. This is the Wagner-Steagall Act, also called the Housing Act of 1937. This is made perhaps more familiar uh, to many of you. This is what uh, created uh, uh, what we know of today as public housing in the United States. Right? We started down this path with the Public Works Administration. The Housing Act of 1937 solidified it. It kept the same kind of income limits, but it dropped language in the legislation about income minimums. Um, but because the housing uh, tended to be built at lower quality levels, and because income limits were a function of the rent that the housing, uh, un the housing authority charged for the, uh, for the units, it meant that we were starting to lower uh, the target to lower income households. Still not by any stretch of the imagination, the most impoverished households living in the U.S. at the day, but still uh, uh, considerably lower than the previous legislation was uh, focused on. Um, it is important to recognize, however, that when, we're, when archival research uh, indicates that when we're looking for people to come into these, this kind of public housing, um, the extens there was an extensive review process, right? So getting over the barrier of having the right income, so to speak, was one of those. During this era, uh, uh, as a policy matter, the housing was strictly segregated, right? So a, a development was either for African Americans or was for whites, right? Um, eventually, we get to a point where there are projects that are, that are uh, uh, merging and, and accepting uh, residents from both races. But initially, there was a strict seg segregation. So that's something that's important to know. On top of that, though, um, we're talking about 25 to 30 applications for each available unit of housing. Right? Now I'm talking specifically about New York, um, which I'll use as a test case here. And so the housing authorities could be really choosy in who they selected to live in the housing. Right? So in addition to an application, you had to sit for an interview um, in your current residence with someone from the housing authority. Um, and they gave you extra points for things like being clean. Uh, they gave you extra points for being employed. Um, and all of this uh, is to say that there was a lot of creaming going on, a lot of cherry picking about who actually got access to the housing. You'll see that reflected in the data I'm going to show you in just a moment. <clears throat> I don't want to lose sight of the fact, however, that Public housing was a real victory. This is a picture of Catherine Bauer, who's an important historical uh, reformer when it came to housing issues in the United States. So after literally decades of inaction, right, Jacob Reese is writing about how the other half lives at the latter, in the latter part of the 19th century, and we're still not doing much above and beyond regulations that are designed to try to improve housing, which for the most part failed horribly. Um, so it took the Great Depression to really act as a catalyst for the U.S. to, to step into public housing in what had been a really antagonistic kind of relationship. It considered socialist, and, uh, and from a political perspective in the U.S., the worst possible sense of the term. Um, but it's also, I, I want to talk about Catherine Bauer because she was really in, uh, intuitively understood that if the, the housing didn't concentrate on a war, large swath of the U.S. public, as it did in Europe, which a lot of these ideas were being imported from, if we only focused on poor households, she feared that the political constituency would erode and that we would be left uh, without a viable program. Um, and so you can see her fingerprints on who we were targeting during this era. The final question I want to uh, get to as a framing device uh, for how to think about this question um, is where should we house and for whom? These are the kinds of questions that the original people uh, who were behind the legislation that created public housing and the housing authorities that were deciding who to admit and, and, and where we should build the housing were really struggling with. Right? So I, I've talked a little bit about for whom already by virtue of who we are targeting and the extensive vetting process that people had to go through. 
But where is another key question, right? Where we we're building in what were considered slum areas, right? Um, which had a host of political advocates, the real estate industry, not not uh, least among them. Or were we building in kind of green areas, right? Were we building on the periphery of cities? Were we trying to deconcentrate poverty and put people out here? Um, again, if you follow current debates about concentrated poverty in the United States, this is a familiar uh, kind of debate, and it was happening certainly in the 1930s as well. <clears throat> So enough about framing. Let's get into some of the substance here. This is a photograph of Queensbridge houses in, uh, in Queens of New York. Uh, this is pretty typical for New York for housing, for public housing built during this era, right? And it, it's not the high-rise housing that came into being in the 50s and into the early 60s. Instead, we're looking at medium rise. This is seven stories. Um, but uh, there's an awful lot of it. I mean, this is, I, I believe, over 3,000 units over, the, over this uh, super block kind of orientation for the housing itself. But it gives you a flavor for the kind of housing that was being built during this era. This was constructed and finally inhabited in 1938, I believe. Let me get to some research questions to help focus uh, uh, my, the, 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 the remarks I'll make after uh, this point. And those questions are two. But first, how did the first residents of public housing compare to the pool of households who were eligible to receive the housing? Right? We, we know, based on the legislation, who is eligible. We know there was an extensive vetting process. I want to understand who actually got it. Right? Um, and, and from there, kind of divine some um, particular values that some of these housing authorities and elected officials and, and legislators in Washington uh, were espousing. The second question is about what effect these new residents had on the socioeconomic conditions that were present in the neighborhoods where we chose to build the housing itself. All right, so two distinct questions, and I'm going to use um, a pretty novel uh, approach to, uh, to the data to help answer them. Um, before I move on to talk about the data, um, let me first uh, talk a, a little bit about the kind of research that, that has been done on this era. Right? So heretofore we've not had a systematic data set where we could actually evaluate who lived in public housing. Instead, what we've relied on is archival research. Right? And archival research, to be sure, is really valuable. Um, it talks a lot about the process by which the housing was created, uh, political discussions about where we would cite the housing, etc. Um, and, and in some cases has a pretty good uh, kind of understanding of who lived there, certainly by numbers and what kind of incomes they had, um, and, and increasingly by uh, uh, citizenship status. We could see some of that there. But the full breadth right, of understanding these residents is really lost when it comes to relying only on archival research. Um, and importantly, uh, it, there's a limited opportunity to compare across uh, 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 these different developments because archival research is so intense um, uh, that you, it, it makes it more difficult uh, to, to look across. I'm hopefully going to rectify some of those things um, with the methodology I'll talk about um, uh, right now. Um, so the data that Dave and I used uh, to start to address these questions, of course, came from the 1940 uh, uh, microdata, right, which I suspect many of you in the room are familiar with. Um, <clears throat> but let me talk a little bit about it in case you aren't. Um, these are uh, complete count data that we have access to from the 1940 census. Right? So every person enumerated in the United States during that time um, is included in these data, as best I can tell. Um, and, uh, and through a partnership with Ancestry.com and the Minnesota Population Center, we've digitized it. Right? And I'll get to a little bit about what it looked like before in a moment. But in addition to that, we're going to be using the actual addresses of the, of the public housing in the city of New York as uh, in 1940, right? So we're, we're looking for those housing developments that have been constructed and inhabited as of the day of the census in, in 1940, right? Um, and in addition to that, we're going to be using enumeration uh, district maps to help locate the, the people who lived in the housing in the actual microdata, okay? So let me, um, let me uh, push on and, and talk a little bit more about what these pieces of data look like. This is an example of the Williamsburg uh, housing <coughs> development and the address, the street addresses that are maintained by the New York Housing Authority. Right? This particular housing is obviously still in existence today in New York. In fact, all of the housing I'll discuss today is still around in New York. Um, and so from here, you get the street addresses. Right? Anyone, these are the mailing addresses. These are going to correspond uh, uh, roughly, or if not exactly, to how they existed in 1940. Okay. So we're really lucky to have uh, a housing authority like, like New York's maintaining these kind of data. Um, this is, I want to 
for illustra illustrative purposes, I want to talk about one particular development in the context of these data. Uh, this is the Williamsburg houses, um, and you can get a sense for it. It's a si similar kind of scale as the previous picture that I showed of Queensbridge houses. Um, and here's how it looks using Google Earth. Right? Um, so uh, we've drawn a red rectangle around the housing. Right? It's clearly demarcated um, not only by architectural style right, and the layout of the housing, um, but also, again, going back to those uh, street addresses, we can tell which housing units are in this housing and which are outside of it, immediately outside of it. Um, uh, and so this is monumental development. Uh, it's spread across many um, city blocks, but it's, again, this low-rise kind of development, um, again, built in 1938. Just to give a little clearer picture, this is what it looks like without the topography included. And you can actually see the building uh, uh, layouts here, right, in, in Google, um, which I'm continually astounded by, um, that they have this kind of uh, specificity. This is the enumeration district map, right? And this is from the 1940 census. Um, when you get a magnifying glass, you can start to make sense of a lot of these numbers, but it's pretty jumbled, right? Um, but what I want to show you is this red rectangle, which corresponds to one, one of those blocks in the public housing. Right? So again, if you look at uh, the Google Earth image, that rectangle is going around this uh, segment of the housing. So what we stumbled upon was this ability to, to use contemporary maps, overlay enumeration district maps, and, and get a good sense of where the data actually were in the 1940 census. Right? So when you, when you do this exercise, you get an understanding that, uh, of, of which enumeration districts you need to pull to actually do the analysis. A little bit more about the 1940 census data. Um, these are person level records. Again, I think many of you are familiar with them. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a wealth of information around everything from educational attainment uh, to employment status to family structure to sex race. I mean, we've got a lot of rich information in these 1940 census data. Uh, this was a big improvement over previous uh, uh, census uh, because uh, uh, the, the, the FDR's administration wanted to use this data collection as a means for, for helping them to understand the scope of the problems and, 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 and how we can so find some solutions to some of what we were experiencing during the Great Depression. Um, we go all the way down to respondents' address here. Um, uh, it goes without saying these are available via IPMS. Um, again, I think many of you in the room are not aware of this. <clears throat> this is what one of the in initial original <coughs> enumeration sheets looks like. Um, this is from uh, uh, that block in Williamsburg houses that I was showing you earlier. And so you can actually see name, address, you can see everything, right? Um, but obviously in not a very helpful format. Um, no one, uh, maybe some graduate students in the room are interested in digitizing this. I'm, I'm not. Um, and so, uh, uh, so it's really helpful to have the digitized version of this. It makes things infinitely easier. In fact, this kind of research would be next to impossible without the digitized version. So how did we identify them? Again, I've alluded to this, but just to be specific, we, we identified which enumeration districts overlapped with where the public housing was located in 1940 in New York City. Right. I'll be specific in a minute, but there are five projects that we're going to look at. Um, and when we did that, we pulled the data for the, for the complete enumeration district. Now, oftentimes, the enumeration di district completely encapsulated the public housing, right, or a part of the public housing. In other cases, there were some margins right, that didn't include public housing residents. And so with that in mind, we set about looking at the individual re records um, to, to see when they had an address that matched one of the building addresses from the housing authority. And when they didn't, we, we could actually locate that address in using Google Earth, verify that it was outside of the boundaries that we were interested in, and, and, um, and then kick it out of the data set. Right? So at the end of the day, we're creating a data set that, that, that we have, a, I think, a high degree of confidence corresponds to the actual public housing residents uh, of the era. To be specific, there were five uh, uh, public housing projects that we evaluated with this research. Um, reading from top to bottom, those are First Houses, Harlem River Houses, Queensbridge Houses, Red Hook Houses, and Williamsburg. Again, all of this housing still exists in New York today. Um, they're spread across three different boroughs, as you can see in the second column. Um, the year they were built and finally occupied, well, this is the occupation year, you can see that all of them occurred before uh, uh, the census. Um, there was one, South Jamaica, I believe, uh, 
um, that, that was occupied three months after the census. Unfortunately, for our, our sake, we had to uh, exclude it from the analysis for that reason. Um, <clears throat> so this, these are the two important columns I want to call your attention to. The first column here, or this is the fourth reading from the left, this is the number of housing units that uh, the housing authority reports today, right? The number of units that are included in each of these developments. And so there's clearly a, a big variation going from 123 units to all the way to 30, almost 3,200. Um, and using our, uh, uh, the, the methodology I've just described to you, here are the households that we were able uh, uh, to locate in the data, right? So um, we, we had a near match or an exact match for first houses in Harlem River houses. Um, we had a slight overcount um, in Queensbridge houses, and we had undercounts in both Red Hook and, and Williamsburg. Um, in, in, in the case of Williamsburg, a pretty uh, slight undercount. In, in the case of Red Hook, um, a slightly larger one. Overall, we came within 1% of, uh, of the housing units that, that the census, t uh, excuse me, that the housing authority tells us is there using our methodology. Um, now, I'm, I'm most concerned uh, with this overcount, right? I mean, clearly I've got some households in here that don't belong. Um, by the same token, though, I'm, I'm less concerned about these undercounts because it's possible that they were either vacant or no one was home at the time of enumeration. Um, th that's a possibility. So I'm more concerned about the overcount and the fact that we only had an overcount of 11 um, make, makes me rest easier at night. Dave, on the other hand, was a basket case by this. <laughs> so if those, are the, um, if those are the actual developments, um, how did we derive and the, the pool of eligible public housing residents, right? Again, uh, these housing authorities are met with the task of selecting who's going to live in the housing, right, from those who apply. But before you can apply, you have to be eligible, right? And so um, we could have gone back to the archives, um, but absent um, a nice piece of funding to take me to New York, that was going to be hard. Um, so instead, what we decided to do was derive the income limits, right, that therefore we would use to pull out who is eligible based on uh, the average rents that different household sizes were paying in the current public housing, right? So let me unpack that a little bit because to make sure it's clear. Um, each of these uh, developments was charging slightly different rents for their housing units because they had to peg the rents to how much it cost to build the housing. Right? And how much it cost to build the housing was dependent upon the level of uh, subsidy the federal government was providing and a number of other provisions. Right? So there's going to be variation for each of these public housing developments during this era on how much they charge uh, for the rent of apartments of various sizes. Right? We can use that knowledge to then kind of back in right, to what the income limits really were because we know who's living there now and how much they're paying in rent by their self-report. Right? So we take the average by development and by household size because it's going to vary um, across all of those uh, uh, parameters. And then we use a either a 5 to 1 or a 6 to 1 ratio of income to rent to determine the income limit. Now where does this ratio come from? In the actual legislation, what's specified is that you couldn't earn more than a 5 to 1 ratio uh, for what you would pay in rent uh, in your income. Right. That was specified in the legislation. But they, they, they relaxed this and created a six to one ratio if you had a household with three or more minor dependents, right? Three or more kids, All right? So that's where these ratios come from and that's how we derived them. We're looking at the average rents that people paid and then extrapolating from that to look within the population of New York City, <coughs> right? We're not going further than New York City to look at our eligibility. Um, uh, who, who earned less than that? Now, in the legislation in 1937, at least, there is not any language about minimum incomes. Um, uh, and, but what we know from the archival research is that uh, housing authorities were uh, loath to admit a charity case, right? They didn't want a household that didn't have any income living in the housing. Um, and so we put as a floor sufficient income to afford at least one year of rent, right? So that's our minimum income, the maximum income we've derived using this 5 to 1 or 6 to 1 ratio of average rents paid uh, to income, okay? Now, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, clarifying questions, and I realize there's a, that may be a little bit uh, opaque. I want to make sure that's clear. 
maybe you're like my students, I'll get lots of questions later about how it's not clear, but um, <laughs> let me move on for now. Um, so what this is eventually going to create is for each development a pool of I eligible households, right? Now there's going to be crossover. You may, be, you may have been eligible given your income and your family structure and so on for many of these housing units, right? But each of the pools is going to look slightly different, okay? So what did the data tell us? Let's get to the fun part of the presentation. Um, one of the things the data tell us, and, and here, um, when you use complete count census data, the one, one piece of the analysis is really pretty straightforward, right? Either there's a difference or there's not, right? We're not, there's no t-test involved, we're not thinking about sampling, right? This is the universe, right? So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna present to you right now are data that show average differences by those who are eligible to live in the housing and those who actually lived in the housing, right? This is the starting point of our analysis. One of the things that emerges is a clear preference for so-called nuclear family households. Think a mother and a father and at least one kid, right? Um, so let me illustrate that to you. This is a, this is a bar chart across the bottom. Whoop, that's the wrong button. Across the bottom, we have uh, the housing developments from First Houses, Harlem River, Williamsburg, Queensbridge, and Red Hook. The blue bar represents the proportion, in this case, of female-headed households among households living in the development. The red bar illustrates, based on the pool of eligible residents, how many of those households had a female-headed household. Okay? So one of the things that emerges really clearly uh, is this preference for male-headed households for those who are eventually admitted into public housing during this era. Right? Uh, they're, they're, it's not even close um, and when you look at the pool of eligible households and those who actually got the benefit. Uh, but it was also a clear preference for married households, right? Um, to the tune of about 90% across developments, right? Uh, those were married households living in the units, and you can see it was more akin to 60 or just above it for the pool of eligible households, right? Again, a clear preference for married households. And then average household size also tells you something. The households that were eventually given access to the uh, public housing in this era tended to be larger, tended to have kids, right? Um, so the nuclear family aspect of the selection criteria come out really, really clearly. There's also, it turns out, a preference for naturalized citizens. Uh, in the PWA era housing, remember there's two kind of pieces of legislation. Um, so when I say naturalized citizens, what I mean by that are those foreign-born residents who have since naturalized and become citizens of the United States. Right? Um, so let me show you some data. Um, wh where this particularly sticks out is in two developments during the PWA era. Right? So here's first houses. About two-thirds of head of, heads of households were naturalized citizens um, of, of the people of the households living in first houses. <laughs> and again, you can see that far eclipses uh, anything, uh, 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 what the eligible pool looked like. The same was true for Harlem River. Uh, if you're a, a student of immigration, you know uh, that, that our, our immigration had, uh, had, had dried up considerably during this era, 1940. Uh, that was due to some legislation, but also the World War and the, and the, and the Great Recession. Um, but the immigrants that did live in New York tended to be from Europe, right? And so Harlem River was the only project of the five I'm looking at here that was designated for African Americans. And that shows you, that that's, a, that's a good exp explanatory fact for why uh, the naturalized uh, house, citizen households, householders were so much lower here, right? But Williamsburg has a similar kind of trajectory as first houses. This era of the housing, Queensbridge and Red Hook, this, these were built under the auspices of the 1937 Act, and we're start, again starting to shift our attention to wealthier or to poorer households, excuse me, and it seems also shifting our attention uh, 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 less to, to a foreign-born element living in the household or living in the project itself. Um, educational attainment. These are also data we've got, and, and one thing that stands out is Harlem River. All right, um, when you look at uh, uh, heads of households that had some high school or more in terms of educational attainment, right, you see that uh, with the exception of Harlem River, these, these developments are closely matching who was admitted and the eligible pool. Right? That's not true with Harlem River. Those who were admitted far outperformed in terms of educational attainment, those who were eligible to live in the house. All right? um, and, uh, and why that might be, I have some ideas and the archival research has helped to, to uh, highlight that fact and we can come back to that perhaps. <coughs> 
the last thing I want to talk about, or maybe the second to last thing, um, <clears throat> is the attachment to the labor market um, of folks living in this public housing. This is a chart looking at the unemployment rate, right? This is self-reported data about labor force status for people uh, in the census. Um, and, and so one of the things that clearly emerges is particularly in this PWA era, the first three projects I'm circling here, right? Um, these were folks who by and large were, uh, were very much attached to the labor force employed in, in comparison to the, the pool of eligible households that could have lived in the housing. Um, that was uh, less true, but still true uh, for the 1937 era housing, Queensbridge and Red Hook. Right? They're still um, less likely to be unemployed, but by smaller margins. And then finally, I want to talk about the shift in, in, in household incomes that occurred between these two eras. Right? So again, these are self-reported, um, but, but looking at the average, or the, excuse me, the median household income for households living in first houses, Harlem River and Williamsburg, it far exceeded uh, the, the household incomes, uh, for, or the median household incomes for those who were eligible to live in the housing. Right? Um, that, that continued to be true for Queensbridge and Red Hook, but look at this big uh, fall off, particularly in re reference to Williamsburg and the median household income in these two eras. Right? The, the, the new focus on, on households of more limited <coughs> economic means is coming through in the data. And you can also see this uh, kind of ironically, uh, while uh, these households earned more, they actually paid less in rent than the pool of eligible households. I mentioned two, two questions that we were focused on. The second question was about how uh, the socioeconomic uh, profile of residents living in the housing compared to the, the neighborhood surrounding the housing. So let me turn to that next, and, and I've got to talk a little bit more methodology now. Um, to find out, uh, we wanted to derive uh, the neighborhood residents, and there are lots of potential ways to do that. The way that we've decided to do it was we, we placed a, a, a center point in the middle of each of the public housing uh, developments, and then we created a half mile circular buffer around that point, right? And, and when we did that, we could look at all the enumeration districts and the data that intersected the buffer, right? And we could pull all of those data into the neighborhood level data. And then we could compare the public housing residents who are part of the neighborhood to those who are not living in the public housing, but by our definition, we're still meeting uh, the, the, the neighborhood uh, 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 buffer. So just to illustrate that, this is again Williamsburg, and you can see the centroid uh, that Dave skillfully put right in the middle and the half mile buffer, right? Um, each of these enumeration districts, if it intersects the buffer, we're pulling all the data into the potential neighborhood uh, uh, structure, okay? Um, and, um, and then uh, starting to parse who lived in the actual housing, which again is located here, with who lived in the neighborhood surrounding the housing. Let me, uh, let me talk about some of the data that came out of this, some of the more notable findings, before I, um, before I conclude. And I'm looking at the clock and I'm well within my parameters, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> So again, uh, these are just simple bar charts looking at uh, the residential profiles in the blue for it across different developments and the neighborhood profiles in red, right? Now we're not talking about eligible households, we're talking about those who live in the neighborhoods outside of the housing developments. And so when it comes again to looking at female-headed households and attention to kind of a so-called nuclear family structure, um, you see that, uh, that, that this kind of preference uh, uh, definitely uh, 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 look different than the surrounding neighborhood. This is particularly true at Harlem River, where about a third of households uh, were female-headed, but it, again, in the housing, it was closer to 12 or 13 percent. Average household side, uh, size, there was, there was less of a difference. Um, uh, we, uh, so in other words, these neighborhoods tend to resemble uh, in one important way, the, the kind of the size of the households, uh, who lived in public housing, right? A lot of kids lived in these neighborhoods, in other words. Median household income, and I think this will be the last data point that I show you um, from this part of the analysis. Um, there's a, a pretty interesting finding here, right? When we talk about this PWA era housing, the first three developments that were created under the uh, Public Works Administration, right? We see this uh, pretty si significant, in at least two of the cases, differences in median household incomes. Uh, and, and, and in the case of Harlem River, uh, uh, still uh, a, a positive selection on income, i.e., uh, the, the creating the housing kind of brought the wealth up in the neighborhood, right? Um, 
uh, in comparison to who was living around it. In contrast, uh, uh, for Queensbridge and Red Hook, uh, these pieces of housing, or these housing developments were sited in neighborhoods where actually the residents living outside of the housing had higher incomes. Right? This is much more uh, in keeping with how we think about public housing uh, in many contexts of the U.S. today. Right? It tends to be extreme, more, much poorer households living in the housing than those that live around it. Um, and this arguably is the start of this trend right, with the 1937 uh, Housing Act. I lied. One more piece of data. So uh, these are the median rents, right? And with the exception of uh, of a Harlem River, um, there's uh, there are some differences, but not as uh, not nearly as big as what we observe in the Harlem River in terms of, of rents. For those of you who are paying rent today um, or have lived in New York uh, during this era, uh, uh, the highest rent in, is was in Harlem River, and that was thirty seven dollars a month, um, just to make you jealous. <coughs> So let me conclude and talk about some next steps that Dave and I would like to take with, uh, with these data. One of the things that emerges is, uh, you know, again, I mentioned in, uh, briefly the archival research on this topic. Um, and and what, we, what we gain from the insights that the archives provided largely is proven, uh, is, is, is uh, reinforced by what we find in the larger, more systematic analysis of the data. Um, so the archives were in fact right, and that's um, very gratifying uh, to be able to replicate that finding using the more systematic approach. Um, the residential profiles, I mean, one of the reasons I was interested in doing this work is I think that when we, when we make decisions as a society about who we admit, uh, into, in this case public housing, who we offer public benefit to, we're also making a statement about what we value, or perhaps equally importantly, what we don't value, right? And so the profiles that I've, that I've used, that I've shown to you of the data, um, they definitely make a statement about what we valued, right? I mean, we were, we, were really, we were really focused during this era on a particular kind of household. Um, at the same time, there were some interesting differences, right? So, um, so looking at this kind of who was it, who was really focusing on immigrants, for example, there's no rhyme or reason. There's no I don't we can't figure out why one development would have done that and another development wouldn't have, right? Um, and so there's a lot of room for additional research in this area, um, but but a lot of this is pretty provocative. Um, our next steps: we want to assemble more data here. Uh, we're looking for uh, uh, we're looking for strong-willed students who are interested in helping with the effort. Um, we, the idea would be to stratify our sample uh, by uh, by size of city. Right, right now we've got New York, and that might be unique. Right. So, what if we pulled in lots of different cities of varying sizes that had public housing during this era? And we also want to stratify by location. Right. Again, this housing is located across 22 different states. So, what would it mean to pull? from a more varied geographic uh, a, a list of potential cities into what we're looking at here. <coughs> All in the service of really getting to this question. Right? These key differences that I've talked about between the early era and the, the slightly later era of public housing, do they persist? Right? If we're looking at a larger uh, sample of, of who lived in public housing during this era. And of course, my own interests are very much around the citizenship issue and understanding how that was uh, part and parcel of how people were selected to live or not in the housing of, uh, of this time. Harlem River uh, is, a, is a study unto itself. Um, again, during this era, it was the only de project that was devoted to African Americans, and it looks different in so many ways from the other projects um, that there's, I think, a lot to, to evaluate there. Let me acknowledge um, a lot of the funders that have made this kind of uh, research possible because of their assembly of the data and also acknowledge Matt Nelson uh, here at MPC for his help in getting us access. And now I will stop talking, give my voice a rest, and, and, and look for questions from you. Thank you for being so attentive. I think we have 20 minutes, is that right, for questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is um, what kind of <coughs> rhetoric, political justification was put out there for building this beyond stimulating the construction industry? I mean, it seems a little um, counterintuitive to think of building public housing for people who, in a depression, are relatively privileged in having, you know, uh, male-headed, um, attached to the labor force, 
you know, fairly high incomes and so on. Like, I mean, I know now we're getting tax cuts for the rich, so I should be able to accept that. But it's still kind of surprising. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, what what arguments were put out there justifying <coughs> giving relatively protected people this social good? And then my second question is, why were so many people applying? for the housing? Was it um, sold to them or was it actually better than alternatives? Like, it's newer, it's not, you know, a dark, uh, crowded tenement. It's, apparently it's not a lot cheaper, but um, you said there were something like four or five applicants to every place. 25 Why? to one. 25 to one. Why did people want to live there? Let me take that one first and I'll come back to the political rhetoric. Um, so, <clears throat> particularly in the early, the PWA, PWA era housing was of really fantastic quality for the time period, right? And they were building this to really high construction specifications. Um, they had rules in place about how many people could live in, in, in a particular room, so they're trying to alleviate overcrowding, etc. cetera, right? Um, so there was a huge demand for this housing because it was demonstrably of higher quality than a lot of the housing that was currently available, right? In addition to that, um, you had, you know, 25% unemployment, right? You had people who were really struggling and in many cases paying more rent, right, than they, were, they would be paying in the housing, right? So while it wasn't the lowest rent that you might imagine, right, it, there, there was, uh, I had a slide that indicated how different the rents actually were, so it was also desirable for that reason. Um, the political rhetoric of the time, how did they sell this, right? I mean, again, this had been a decades-long battle Right? And so I, one of the reasons I wanted to highlight Catherine Bauer is because she was out in front for a long time right, in fighting this political fight. And, and Catherine Bauer seized upon the political reality and the political constituencies that were going to get the ear of FDR. Right? She, she, she was of the mind that eventually she wanted two-thirds of people living in government-supplied housing. Two-thirds of households. Now it's a residual category. Right? But if you look at some, during this era, what's going on in Europe, right? it's, it's wide swaths of the public. And she knew that if she got to that point, right, then it would be a sustainable, politically sustainable program. Right? Um, that it wouldn't be uh, seen as just the impoverished who were benefiting, wrongly, rightly, however people might conceive that, that it would be everyone saw a stake for themselves in this. And so her targeting the middle was politically expedient, because these are folks who were politically potent. right? I mean, they had uh, the ear of key congressional members and the president, right? and, um, and, and they didn't have any stigma attached to them, right? They, they had they'd just been let off and, and foreclosed upon or evicted and were really struggling. Now, we have, all of us have sets of values that we could bring into this and think about whether that was the right approach or the wrong approach, or many people disagreed with that particular strategy and thought we should, we should be targeting the neediest of the needy during the, the Depression. Um, we have finite resources, why not uh, focus on the poorest of the poor? Um, that was not the political argument that held the day, though. Yeah, Jen? Um, yeah, well, this is super fascinating and awesome. So. Um, Kudos to you guys, but uh, I had a couple of suggestions that might make things a little bit more, um, well one is an easy suggestion and the other one takes a lot more work. Um, one is that, so a lot of these, uh, these, you know, it's really great to just see the, the basic cross tab, you know, <coughs> married and female headed and income and rent and all that, but I'm wondering if it might be a little bit more informative um, to do some conditional type cross tabs, like for example, we, if like, you, I mean, you showed that you know there's fewer female-headed households in in the um, in the public housing. Well, of course, also you're going to see higher marriage rates within the household, within them, right? So it'd be nice. It would be interesting to see, and it might inform inform you a little bit on how how they were selecting their residents. If you looked at you know, given that you were in a female-headed household, um, where they were you married, um, you know conditioning on are you a female-headed household or are you a male-headed household, and then looking at income differences, things like that, uh, I think can, can add a lot to this. Um, <coughs> the other uh, um, thing that I would be super interested in is uh, what were these people doing in 1930? Because um, you, could, you could match them to the 1930 um, records and see, you know, um, especially, uh, you know, were they were they better off in 1930 as well, or were they just the lucky ones that you know survived the Great Depression a little bit better? I mean, you're, I mean, of course, you're not going to know what happened between 1930 and 1940, which is super important, of course, but uh, but it could help you get at some. <coughs> 
um, sort of selection dynamics on like how um, how they were doing back in 1930. Good. Thank you for the suggestions. I think that the conditional cross tabs make a lot of sense as does looking at more sophisticated multivariate <coughs> models. And we've started to do that, but it's not at a state where I can prepare, where I can uh, show it to you yet. Um, but we're absolutely headed in that direction. On the linking thing, Dave and I have been discussing that. I'm a little intimidated by linking. <laughs> like having just come from the Social Science Historical Association and, and, and seeing people present on how difficult they can really be. Um, but it's certainly something I'm willing to, um, to give a try to. And I think Dave is eager and moving in that direction as well. Right, because clearly, yeah, we want to, it would be great to understand um, in a more com complete sense, like, uh, where, where were people 10 years before this, right? How had their lives changed, right? Is this really the submerged middle class, in other words? Right, that would be a great great thing to do. I'm going to work my way across, so here, and then to you. Brian, you have some numbers you showed about the household size, but in some ways they're responding to how many bedrooms were built in the units. Have you looked at that at all? So one of the things we don't have from the data are how many uh, rooms are in the dwelling, right? So we don't, uh, and in the archives we can go and see what kind of rules they had about, you, you may or may not be aware that there are lots of rules in place about sing, uh, same sex or, or, or different sex kids sharing bedrooms and at what age and so on, and it gets pretty complicated fast. Right? But unfortunately we don't have good data uh, on number of rooms in the census data during this period. But housing authority knows how many bedrooms are in those units. Right. And I suspect you know, there aren't any one bedrooms, which is one of the reasons you're going to have larger households. Mm -hmm. uh, that is true. That is true. So I, we can, again, it, it, it means a trip to the archives, um, which Kira might be in a position to fund. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, but you're right. You're right. We could follow up on that. No. Yes. I think as a follow-up on the conditional cross tabs to looking at uh, residents versus neighborhood, who in the neighborhood is eligible versus not eligible, I think the idea of are they, how different are they, or what does the rest of the neighborhood look like would be really interesting. Yeah, so looking, to make sure I understand you correctly, not only surround, not only neighborhood, but eligibility pool within neighborhood. Yeah. Okay, good. Yvonne. So before you uh, jump back to, Leaf, uh, to Lincoln into 1930, I mean, one thing to do is look at where people were in 1935 with the migration question. Yep. Clearly these people are going to have moved, so they're not going to be the same house. Um, but it seems likely that they're probably going to be more likely than their neighbors to be sort of within the county or the city, because um, the connections to you know, get into housing, it sounds like it could be pretty important. So we've done some kind of preliminary looks at that. The data are a little all over the place, as you're well aware. Um, but you're right, right? The vast majority of people were, were New York residents, right, five years prior. Um, and, you know, given the slowdown in immigration, most of the immigrants that are in sample had been here considerably longer than five years, right? And so, which actually, uh, linking, who said linking? It gives me some kind of, uh, I think we actually could do some interesting work on linking, because again, even when you're talking about immigrants, most of them probably would have been in the United States 10 years prior. Yeah, exactly. A lot of the lim immigration limiting uh, legislation happened in the 20s. 1924, yeah. Was there another hand? One and then two. I just wanted to follow up on Will's comment that, just to be explicit, I think if you could find out the number of bedrooms in the public housing units, we do know the Number of bedrooms from the census? Not in 40. Not in 40. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> uh, Ten years later. Ten years later. I mean, believe me, we, we were definitely wondering that question, right? And it would have made this whole thing a lot easier, actually, if we had those data. They asked it for the other housing census. It's not in this population. Yes? Um, can you say anything about who was um, making the decisions about um, who was conducting the interviews, who was saying, Yes, you pass, and no, you don't. And you know, one thought in terms of the um, the preference to naturalized immigrants, if it might be, you know, people connected to like a political machine that was in some areas mm -hmm. underpinned by yeah. um, <coughs> immigrant preponderance of voters. Um, anyway. Yeah. So these are these are really good questions. Um, I mean, the archival research on this does reveal something about who is who is who is on the board of people making these kinds of decisions right so to your question it's an opportunity to marry kind of archival research with with a, a more data driven 
uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 piece of research to, to bring some new light to the situation. Um, now, uh, that said, I, I thought about the political machine too. Right? I mean, I wondered how much that might have influenced this. And um, I know there are historians in the room who can speak to this better than I can, but when I've read some of the historical accounts of this era, we're talking about LaGuardia as mayor during this era, and I, my understanding is that he was, he was running real large in a platform of rooting out machines, right? That it, the machines had lost uh, some of their power that they had had in previous decades, right? And so, um, and in fact, when you look at some of the archival accounts about how uh, or, or how the legislation was passed, it was passed largely um, to provide some insulation from, from people who were worried about machines using this as patronage, right? Um, and so they constructed the housing authorities in a way that made it difficult for it to be used as patronage. Um, so by design, but also, as, again, my uh, unlearned uh, understanding as a non-historian is that, that machines were kind of waning in terms of the influence that they had uh, during, as of 1940. But Historians in the room, please correct me if I'm wrong. Will, is, is it? Historian. Okay. I've got another question. Okay. So, what do you know about, you've got some hints at it, what do you know about how these locations were chosen for these developments? Um, <clears throat> were they just open space and therefore available? Or is there anything in the archives that talk about not in my neighborhood kinds of fights? <clears throat> So um, the, you know, the political bedfellows around public housing during this era were pretty interesting, right? So there's an awful lot of speculative real estate interests that wanted the housing located in where they owned real estate, right? Because and oftentimes these were slum areas where they weren't commanding, uh, 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 you know, well, they, they saw a potential to reap a substantial financial benefit from selling to the government, right? But there was a big... So, sort of more clear on your first three that were, where you had um, three the income of the people who were in public housing was much higher than the surrounding yeah. territory, less so in the later ones. Less so in the later ones. Um, but more to your point, I, and I can talk in aggregate terms about this, in the, for the PWA era housing, there was 22,000 public housing units built, give or take a few. Of those, over 60% were cited in what were, what, were, what were declared slum areas. Right. Um, which drove some housing reformers absolutely batty, right? Because they saw this as rewarding bad behavior on the part of landlords, right? They were getting a substantial financial benefit after years and years and years of, of ma not maintaining buildings, et cetera. Um, and again, this large debate around, should we be developing on the margins of cities and deconcentrate poverty, right? Um, should we, uh, should we open up uh, kind of what were then like the proto, kind of prototypes to suburbs and start moving people on the periphery? Um, or should we, uh, or should we rebuild? Right. That was this is a big uh, political fight, and overwhelmingly the uh, build in the slum areas won. Even in the last, even in the later era. Even in the later area, era. Yeah. I haven't heard from Robin. Then I'll come to you, Jen. Um, do you have any information about people who applied but weren't accepted? <laughs> you know the number, but you don't know anything about. You them. can go to the archives and find. I, some of the archives uh, during this era list some of that information because I've seen it in secondary materials. List their names? No, not that I'm aware. They would have aggregate kind of information. Right, but that would be really interesting. Is that the same question for you? Yeah, I mean, also uh, uh, about like, uh, like to follow up on Miriam's question, like who was deciding? You know, like was it a different board for each of the five unit, five things, or was it like the same board for the earlier okay. ones and the later ones? Like who was doing the interviews, like those sorts of things? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I have a suspicion it was different for each project, but I don't know that. Anyone over here? <laughs> I see you in the back. You have inquisitive faces. Come on. Yes. Oh, um, do you do you have any idea of like sort of the long-term impacts of um, some of these policies and what, maybe what your opinion is? So when you say longer-term impacts, do you mean what it meant to have this housing located in this neighborhood yeah, starting 1940? Yeah, neighborhood level or just, <coughs> at least in New York City, public housing trends, what that knockdown effect was for the next year. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I have ideas about directions to go. And, that are related to the question you're asking. Um, 
but I haven't done so yet, right? And so, I mean, you could, because all of these housing developments are still there, right, one of the things that would be interesting is to fast forward to 2010 and look at how different the neighborhoods really were, right? How different the, we, we can also tell the profile of the people living in the housing today. We could compare that, right? That, that would be fascinating. Um, I haven't done it yet. Um, uh, my colleague Ed Getz at Humphrey, I think, is interested in that question. Um, his long-standing interest in public housing, um, and so it's it's potential to bring a new uh, researcher into the MPC's orbit, right? Uh, we can get Ed involved in this. Uh, so I think that I think there's a lot of potential in, in addressing kind of what you're uh, mentioning. My first step is going to be to diversify our pool and get out of just New York, because I'm sensitive to the idea that people can look at this and say, well, New York is New York, but Louisville, Kentucky is something quite different, right? We didn't, we didn't make the same kinds of choices, et cetera. Um, and it would be interesting to see how much uh, that's true or not, right? But a, a very good suggestion, thank you. I think, Dan, one of the other things we've talked about is can we link the public housing residents in 1940 with other administrative data sets to see what was it like to be a kid in public housing in 40? What was your long-term life outcomes, what does that look like for you, given that these were the first, literally the first public housing units that had ever, ever existed. Um, so, you know, I would talk to Rob about what that might look like related to some of the work he's doing on 1940. Um, There's 31,000 individuals who lived in public housing at that, at that time, That's in right. New York only, and, and many more throughout the rest of the country. So I see your hand, and you had a hand too. Yep. So did these all stay by, um, public? Were yes. Any of them sold? No. That seems to be kind of all public. Remarkable, given what we know about sort of the whole ideology of privatization and you know taking government out of things and smaller government, that they all yeah. stayed public housing. Actually, when you well, so in my, in this case, what I presented that is true. <coughs> when you look at the. Uh, at the, at the public housing that was built as of 1940, we've lost substantial shares of it to demolition, right? Uh, either a kind of a Hope Six redevelopment project, Atlanta, the, the public housing that was built during this era in Atlanta is no longer there, right? It was cleared in preparation for the Olympics, actually. Um, and, and so there, there are some uh, gaps, right? But for the most part, most of this housing still exists. And one of the reasons it still exists um, I, you can uh, see in the comment I gave early on, this was pretty high quality stuff, right? If you go to New York today, these are still some of the most desirable housing units for people who live in public housing, right? You want to live in first houses, right? It's a fantastic place to live because of the high quality, right? I mean, like ornate built-ins, kind of carved stuff, right? This doesn't happen anymore. Um, and so, um, so to answer your question, no. I mean, this is all still public. Uh, Last question. How does how does turnover work? I'm just I'm thinking too about the idea of linking and looking forward to 2010. If I can keep this in my family, do I get to stay there, or when that householder dies, yeah, how does so that let, happen and how do we follow it down? That I don't know uh, the exact answer to your question, okay. but I think it would be a danger to confuse public housing with rent control. Yeah housing, which is that typically the story you hear more often. You're like, we're going to keep it in the family. and um, <clears throat> That's not generally how it works, although you can certainly see generational house, generational uh, households that have lived in public housing, right? Um, but it may not be the same unit. And I guess, so I'm thinking about the idea of, right, as, as those numbers decrease, but arguably people in need of public housing have not decreased, how does, does having been in there before in any way give you uh, or having grown up there give you a, a leg up in terms of accessing that very finite number of units? Um, yeah, potentially, okay. because of, of the bureaucratic processes around getting access to okay. the housing and understanding how those work. So having previous exposure to it definitely could have. Okay. Um, but, um, but I'm afraid that's the kind of most specific example I can, or answer I can give you, which is really unsatisfying for the last question, but there it is. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I appreciate it.